wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore mahasiswa Fakultas Hukum Universitas Mula Warman dan saya juga ucapkan selamat sore teman-teman eh, dosen-dosen di Fakultas Hukum Universitas Mula Warman. Eh, hari ini kita juga kedatangan beberapa samdin from other university in East Borneo, Prof. Heng. And special untuk Prof. Heng dan Prof. Thomas dan Dr. Rico yang hari ini membersamai kuliah kita dan adalah topik yang menarik ketika kita berbicara tentang uh, hukum administrasi negara. Dan hari ini kita mencoba uh, melihat perkembangan hukum administrasi negara dalam kondisi yang dekdikduk. Sehingga pada sore hari ini kita memilih tema uh, The Limit and Opportunity of Administrative Law to Prevent Authoritarianism. And Indonesia have a de developing law at the same time this make it worry uh, so many fact indicated the authoritarian the authoritarianism in Indonesian system it start from the making of regulation in legislative uh, for gaining listen with uh, centralism authorities in Indonesia and other 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 concept of omnibus law and so many Uh, condition in our in country is uh, indicated the authoritarianism. Now, today we have uh, three lecturers. The number one is Professor Heng Edi. He is professor in Administrative Law and Good Governance Institute of Constitution and uh, Administrative Law Utrecht University. Good morning. Prof. Heng Edding. Goedemorgen. Uh, I hope you in good condition and healthy. And yep. Prof. Thomas Schmidt, uh, thank you for joining in this webinar because this is not only knowledge about us, but this is spirit too. To Professor and Dr. Rico can join with us. And Professor. Thomas Kimit is Professor Administrative Law in the ADD Lecturer in Gajah Mada University. Dan juga Dr. Rico Andi Wibowo. Beliau adalah uh, dosen di Fakultas Hukum Universitas Gajah Mada. Nah, kita adalah, kalau bahasa in uh, local local, local Local speech in Samarinda, right? This bubuhan administratif loh. <laughs> ya, yeah. uh, terima kasih, uh, Prof Heng, Prof Thomas, and with us is our dean, uh, Dr Mahendra Putra Kurnia. We will uh, open this webinar, and please, Dr Mahendra, giving first speech for us. Please, Dr. Mahindra. Oke, okay, baik. Thank you. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, uh, I would like to say thank you to our guest uh, in this noon. Uh, maybe uh, it is the first time we meet. Uh, and for the first time, uh, all of the speaker come to uh, Fakulta, Fak Faculty of Law uh, invitation. Uh, uh, I would like to say thank you to Professor Dr. Thomas Smith, Professor Dr. Heng Adin, and Mas Riko Andi Wibowo uh, yang udah meluangkan waktu uh, to give an experience uh, with, to share an experience and knowledge with us in Faculty of Law Mulawarman University with the topic of the limit and The, an opportunity of administrative law to prevent authoritarianism is the very important uh, topic in Indonesia, and I think it will make uh, our knowledge about uh, 
Atau interest low in Indonesia is very uh, as make us to know what about the practice in other country about <coughs> administrative law, administrative law in order to prevent authoritarianism. So once again, uh, thanks for your kindness to join our uh, webinar in order to share knowledge and experience with us. Mr. Professor Dr. Thomas Smith, Mr. Professor Dr. Hank Ading, and Mas Rico and Rico. Have a nice discussion and uh, hopefully he can finish this uh, webinar with good situation. Okay, uh, back to Mrs. Najida. Uh, thank you and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahindra Putra. Ya, Prof. Thomas, Mas Rico, and Prof. Heng. I think this is not only university from East Borneo, but from North, North and uh, all Borneo. I see from Universitas Borneo Tarakan. I uh, join with us too. With, so many university in Borneo with join. Oh uh, ya, yeah. teman-teman uh, uh, mahasiswa uh, pada prinsipnya pada level penyelenggaraan per, uh, pemerintahan kita hari ini uh, berbagai kebijakan represif nampaknya ada pemaksaan begitu secara legal dilakukan atas nama hukum dan sebenarnya hukum administrasi negara itu juga berperan di situ bagaimana kita bukan hanya sekedar melakukan formalitas hukum tapi juga can prevent mencegah suatu hal yang tidak seharusnya terjadi di Indonesia misalnya eksploitasi itu bisa ditercegah bisa dicegah oleh hukum administrasi negara begitu juga hak 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 asasi manusia juga bisa dicegah oleh hukum administrasi negara. Bagaimana juga peradilan seharusnya menjadi tonggak bagaimana sebuah negara hukum ini berdiri dan dapat mampu memberikan jawaban keadilan atas kebijakan-kebijakan yang telah dilakukan oleh pemerintah. Nah, bagaimana konsep terkait dengan masa depan dan juga keterbatasan hukum administrasi negara terkait dengan otoritarianisme ini kita akan bahas pada sore hari ini dan saya persilahkan Profesor Heng Edi maybe first to get open in this lecture we have maybe after that Dr Rico after that uh, Prof Thomas please welcome Prof Heng Edi to give us the lecture thank you very much Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Nadia, uh, and all the colleagues from Indonesia. Perhaps it's the first time that we will meet each other. Perhaps I have met you uh, in, in the past. Uh, that was several times in several places in Indonesia. So perhaps it's Nice to see you again. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy to be uh, together with uh, Thomas and uh, Rico in, uh, in this interesting uh, seminar. I have one practical problem because it's still Eastern here in uh, Europe and, and I have to leave at 9.30. So I will try to do in time, uh, not too quickly my uh, presentation, uh, but uh, it, it is as it is. Um, about the topic to prevent authoritarianism, it's important, uh, of course, to realize what it means. Uh, when you want to prevent something, you have to know what you want to prevent. And you want to prevent, uh, uh, when you look in definitions, you want to prevent the rejections of the political pluralism. Uh, you want to prevent that there is a strong central power. You want to prevent that uh, preserve the political situation quo. And 
you want to have a reduction to prevent the reduction of the rule of law. You want to prevent a reduction of democracy. That is what you, when we speak about the topic of prevention of authoritarianism, what what what, what we speak about uh, today. And and uh, I had uh, from a let me say administrative law. Uh, perspective, but also in combination with constitutional law, because yeah, for us, they are both in very close interrelated to it. it it's it's not, uh, not possible to understand administrative law really good when you don't know anything about constitutional law. And it's sim the same when you want to really understand constitutional law, you have also to uh, know uh, administrative law. So I always uh, uh, think it's good to have the combination and it's also nice to be here at the, uh, what we call the Constitutional and Administrative Law Society. So it's the good topic on the good place with the good people to discuss this issue. Uh, the topics which I will uh, speak about is, uh, you will not uh, su be surprised it will be about the legal dimension of the of the uh, of the problem, and then I will speak about law and policy, human rights, about decentralization, law enforcement, corruption. Now, all kinds of topics, legal dimension of these topics are related to the central topic of yeah authoritarianism. What what in what I understood from publications, especially Australian publications, that there is uh, a situation of more authoritarianism in um, in Indonesia. I will say something about the dichotomy in administrative law, good governance, and say something about legal problems from the perspective of concepts and principles of administrative law about the let me say, administrative law situation in Europe, in several countries and on European level, uh, and also about the effectiveness of administrative law. So I hope that by saying that, that an administrative law approach is a part of the solution of that problem of prevention of authoritarianism. Um, when we speak about the uh, topic of um, uh, authoritarianism, you can say there are different elements of the problem and different dimensions of the approach. At least there are from a legal approach, a legal constitutional administrative law approach uh, that, that we have to get clear when we speak about this topic, we have to speak about the rule of law, we have to speak about democracy, and we have to speak about good governance. That are three fundamental notions, you can say a cornerstone from a constitutional administrative law perspective in a modern state. And what is first point, uh, I have to say something about the rule of law. There is a big difference between the rule of law from a, from a, uh, from a, um, uh, 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 the, the, the system of the UK and the American, they, they have rule of law, especially from a legality principle. When you look more to the what we call continental system, the rule of law has a broader perspective. So you have a narrow and a broader perspective, and the broader perspective is very important to look to it and to see the difference with the, uh, now let me say the, uh, uh, the approach, for instance, from Australians, uh, you, you you will have to see that. And uh, Thomas will uh, 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 agree with me that from the German also a strong influ influence of the broader perspective of rule of law in the sense of Rechtsstaat. That's, that's an important point. We have to speak about that. The second point is about democracy. In democracy, when in a, in a classical sense, democracy is is, is a kind of representation. Uh, the, 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 uh, you see in a, uh, a, 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 a yeah, traditional way of looking to the democracy, yeah, okay, we have a parliament representation and that's enough. But that, that, is, that is, you can say, a, classic, a classical approach on democracy. 
more and more you see in countries in modern ways of societies that there is more and more a need of more direct democracy in addition to the representative democracy. So we see a discussion about democracy. And the third point is, yeah, good governance. Good governance, which is coming from uh, your original all kinds of international organizations, uh, which is going down more and more on local level. And uh, for instance, my book on good governance uh, is worked out that the concept of Good governance is one of the three concepts of a modern state, the rule of law, democracy, and good governance, and is will, worked out by principles, legal principles, principles of law. I will say something about during my presentation. Uh, I also have to say, when you look to administrative law, you see sometimes a more narrow view, especially in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, the, there is a narrow view in the sense that it's only looking to administrative uh, activities with legal effect. Uh, more and more broader, you can say a more a French approach is that all, all the administrative uh, activities are uh, relevant when they are coming from the administration. And sometimes it's public, sometimes it's private, but you have that broader approach. So it's important for an administrative law uh, approach to, to know, are you from a, a broader or a narrow uh, approach of administrative law? And that's also relevant in the context of this topic, which this, we discussed today. Um, Speaking about the legal dimensions I say, of, 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 the, of the topic, uh, I said, yeah, we have to, to speak about some legal dimensions. Uh, for instance, on law and policy, uh, uh, relevant, relevant is the, the legislation, but also the implementation, uh, my policy rules and directives and, and the enforcement. How is the enforcement done? Yeah, the, the role of, of course, the judicial decisions, uh, you can say also the role of the constitutional court in Indonesia, but also when you speak about the role of ombudsman, of how KPK is functioning. So law and policy is a topic and there are all kinds of uh, elements which has to be discussed. Um, the second point I was to make that we have to make from a legal perspective to, to see a difference between policy and principles. Uh, all principles are not policy, not all policies are not principles. So we always have to look when we speak about policies, what are the principles of good governance, the principles of rights and obligations, which are relevant. So when you look in the Netherlands, a gala, you find policy rules, they have legal effect, but there is a, a, a difference between policy rules and general binding rules, which have a much more broader uh, effect. So policy and principles is relevant in the discussion, but also decentralization. Uh, Indonesia is in a unitary states, a decentralized unitary states, and the question is, yeah, how are the roles dividing? Is it, is it all coming from, from Jakarta and in the future from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the, the other parts of Indonesia? But anyway, there is, there is a need for a discussion of dividing and also respecting the role. In a, in a unitary state, there is often an approach of top-down, but when you really speak, about a dividing unitary state, the central level has also to respect a certain, a certain autonomy of, of the decentralized level. So also there, a kind of discussion about uh, this issue. Now, and in the field of enforcement, the, the, the classical fields. Um, speaking about the yeah, administrative law, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm especially interested in uh, innovation of uh, administrative law. And then you can say <coughs> there are two lines in administrative law. I speak about the dichotomy 
of administrative law. You have two main lines. And the first line is the position of the uh, and the role of the administration. You can say that's the internal perspective of administrative law. But you have also the position of the citizens, the external positions. And in some countries or in some people <coughs> uh, uh, are more focusing on the, let me say, the administration perspective, and others are more uh, 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 focusing on protecting the position of citizens. But administrative law is about both. It's not the one or the other, it's both. And therefore, the dichotomy of administrative law is, from my perspective, uh, very in, uh, uh, important. And there are all kinds of new developments, but uh, I have not so much time on it. But uh, when, when you form a classical approach, look to administrative law, they are saying, ah, it's a kind of specification of constitutional law with a fixation on the law. And the written law. That, that, that is a, a kind of classical approach <coughs> of administrative law, focusing on written law or written law. Uh, in a modern sense, that is a too restrictive approach. They, uh, 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 that is as well as in relation to the administration, as well as in relation to the citizens. Written law is too restrictive, so you need also an written law and there you see more and more a kind of uh, a broader perspective a growing role of the steering character of general law in administrative law you see that in 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 the netherlands but also in germany but in 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 many, uh, several countries a kind of general administrative law act in indonesia also you have that but it is still very narrow when you compare it for instance with the gala there is a kind of specification of <coughs> constitutional law. When you look, for instance, to good governance, that's a good example. Good governance are, for instance, the specification of uh, the participation uh, uh, element in democracy, uh, the participation principle. Or when we speak about uh, transparency, transparency, you can say it's original constitutional law uh, uh, element, but it is worked out in uh, as a uh, <coughs> transparency principle also in admi modern administrative law. <coughs> and so it's also more and more a direct link <coughs> with uh, the specific fields of administrative law. So we have not only uh, general administrative law, but we have a direct link with environmental law, direct link with all kinds of di uh, yeah, digitalization. We have direct links <coughs> with different um, f specific fields of law. <coughs> and there is a growing importance of uh, criminal law, private law, and international law and European law in the, in the European situation. So, more and more, my, my focus is on good governance, uh, good governance. And uh, there you see from that, let me say, new approach, uh, uh, leaving behind us the classical approach, you say, when we speak about state, it's no longer a separation of, but more a balancing of powers in the state. Uh, you can say that's a constitutional approach. And there is a growing importance of what we call the fourth independent powers in the state, like the Ombudsman and the Court of Order. So the national state, we have the rule of law in a broader perspective, the Rechtsstaat, and we have the democracy uh, principle in that broader perspective. And um, when we look on good governance, you find that worked out, I said already, on, on, on a regional level in the uh, Council of Europe or in the European Union, but it's also more and more worked out in, on national level. And it's worked out in six principles, which I mentioned here, 
proper administration, transparent administration, participative administration, effective administration, accountable administration, human rights administration. That's six principles of good administration and of broader set, good governance are worked out. Um, then we look to that problem, which we are discussing now, we have to say, what, what is the answer? What is the answer from that different perspectives, which are just... Uh, uh, Sorry, I don't know. Uh, Najida, somebody is asking me or saying something. Hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, Prof. Heng, I cannot. Your... Shall I continue? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what, what do we see of the, let me say, the legal problem of the authoritarianism? How is that worked out? And on these points, which I just mentioned, fundamental points, how are they worked out in countries in, uh, in uh, uh, um, Europe? When you look to the Netherlands, you, you see that these uh, three cornerstones are worked out in our constitutional and administrative law uh, ad, uh, system. New, what I'm telling now new is new that there is they have changed, and that change is just accepted by the parliament in the constitution written down that the rule of law, democracy, and human rights are the cornerstones for the Netherlands states. So it has explicit, not implicit, explicit and fundamental base in the constitution. And it is worked out in principles, in the gala, very detailed. It's, we have no time to work it out, but that, so you can say, these modern elements are codification. There is a codification in constitutional law and in administrative law. When you look to Germany, the th three cornerstones, rule of law and, 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 and democracy are worked out and, uh, in, in the constitution, but they are not so strong worked out in the Verwaltungsverfahrensgesetz. Not so, uh, now let me say, uh, as I compare it with the Gala, uh, the, so, so uh, there is still somewhat to be done, I would say in Germany, but I say it from the Netherlands perspective, no <laughs> uh, Then France, France is not so explicit in the constitution, nor in the administrative law. In France, these principles are mostly worked out by the judiciary, only in judicial case law. <coughs> so what you see in France, it's the court, who is correcting, not correction by the legislator or correction by the administration. Correction is especially done by, by the judiciary. And when you look to uh, the UK, uh, yeah, they, they are still in the phase of the rule of law uh, doctrine, but they don't have, an, an, uh, yeah, they have an, what we call an unwritten uh, constitution. Uh, there are discussions about a new, a new constitution. What you see in UK is that only on some topics, there is some legislation, for instance, on human rights. Interesting is to see on European level, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, I, it's a very promising, uh, also an inspiring uh, national administrative law and national constitutional law. Interesting is, to see the difference between uh, the European Union law and the, uh, the law of the Council of Europe, including the Court on Human Rights. When you see the EU law, EU law is, you can say it's it's national system on European level. They have a parliament, they have an ex implement, uh, executive, they have a judiciary. So it's, it's, it's uh, on, on European le level worked out. Partly it has to be implemented on national level, but also on European level is very strong developed. And it means that it's on, related to rule of law and democracy, but also on human rights. It's, they have in the, you can say the constitution of the European Union, these human rights worked out. 
when you look to the Council of Europe, they have a court on human rights, but they are only focusing on democracy and human rights. They have a more restrictive approach when you look to the fields. Uh, and most of it is worked out on, uh, on uh, uh, national, the implementation is on national level. Enforcement can be done by the European Court of Justice. When you want to know much more about it, that is my book on uh, good governance. I thought, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is my book on good governance. <laughs> uh, uh, and then you will find more uh, worked out these uh, topics. Now, yeah, then the effectiveness. It means when we can speak about concept and principle, uh, also in the context of Indonesia, but that's not enough. It's not only paperwork, it's also daily work. It means that the people working in the administration of the Indonesian government, yeah, they have to follow these lines. And one of the conditions for a successful and effective administrative law in Indonesia is that the leaders of the country, the administrative authorities of Indonesia, are in the position to create, to implement, and to enforce this kind of norms. And if so, then there will be also effectiveness of administrative law in Indonesia. But it depends, of course, on the people. It depends on the leaders of the country. It depends on the legislator. It depends on the administration in practice. That is from my uh, uh, perspective. Um, it, there is another point what I also have to say in relation to the Indonesian situation. I have read several publications, what I said, especially from Australian uh, uh, opinion, because my Bahasa is minimal, minimal of the minimal. So uh, sorry for that. But, um, but I think we should also be clear that when, when we have this approach, it's only a legal perspective. And, and also legal perspective in, in practice means it's only the legal dimension. And the topic has, has more dimensions. Uh, that's clear. It has also social science, it's a, an economic dimension. So we have to get be clear. We, have, we are important from the legal dimension, but we are not the only one. So there are more dimensions of the problem. And uh, that is what I want to say, several dimensions of the problems and, and also several perspectives of, of the op approach are more. Anyway, an interdisciplinary approach is at least then the link between legal and non-legal have to be made. So there should be not only lawyers, but also social, social scientists. So that is, I would say also from my perspective, uh, 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 near that in, uh, in, in, in uh, relation to this uh, topic. So the conclusions, different elements of the problem and different dimension of the approach, legal elements of the problem, more on policy, legislation, implementation, enforcement, policy, concept, and principles, decentralization and enforcement, the dichotomy of administrative law and, and modernization of administrative law, the role of good governance if embedded in concept and democracy, uh, in, in concept of rule of law and democracy and implemented by principles. Effectiveness of administrative law depends also on the leaders of the state and the members of the administration. And, and administrative law is a condition sine qua non for the discard problems, but then also linked to the non-legal dimensions of the problem. So these are the six principles and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, the time is 9.39, 9, 9, so I have not so much time for answering the questions. That was my presentation. Najida. Yes. Mas Adi Guna, nanti dulu ya, nanti uh, sebentar kita akan, saya sudah baca. Uh, chatnya dari Mas Adi Guna nanti uh, setelah itu. Thank you, Prof. Heng. Uh, this is we get a question from Adi Guna, but now please, uh, Dr. Rico. Yeah, I, Najida, 
And I yes. say, I, I, I'm now leaving. Uh, I have my email address on the oh, my yes. presentation. Please, uh, if people want to ask questions, uh, send me an email and I will answer the questions. Yeah. Yes, Is that okay? It's okay, it's okay. Mbak teman-teman, Prof. Heng uh, ada sedia limit waktu untuk bisa join dengan kita. Mungkin Prof. Heng uh, akan bisa join kembali dan beliau bersedia untuk nanti menjawab by email begitu ya. Prof. Heng, thank you very much for, for your join with us with our our campus will be next time and next step we have join in webinar again okay uh, we have so many questions for you <laughs> uh, thank you you compare uh, okay. our knowledge with netherlands germany france and uk and every i was no very detail in constitution but i think it's it uh you have limit time so we... okay thank you prof heng yeah thank you very much i wish a good conference nanti uh, saya akan simpan alamatnya nanti insyaallah uh, saya akan kirimkan email ke prof heng dan prof heng bersedia untuk menjawabnya nanti ada prof thomas dan dr riko juga yang akan menjawabnya prof heng okay. thank, thank you, you very, very much. much goodbye bye bye see you prof heng yeah Ya, masa diguna, don't worry, nanti saya akan coba, nanti send nomor WA atau emailnya di saya, nggak apa jadi masalah. Itu pertanyaan nanti bisa dijawab mungkin Pak Rico atau Prof. Thomas. Ya, Untuk narasumber yang kedua, saya persilahkan Dr. Rico untuk menyampaikan perspektif keterbatasan dari hukum administrasi negara dan kondisi di Indonesia terkait dengan uh, otoritarianisme hari ini. Mungkin Mas Riko, kita punya waktu 20 atau sampai 25 menit. Saya persilahkan Mas Riko, uh, Dr. Riko. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, I would like to express my gratitude ya yeah, to Pak ya. To Pak Dekan, Pak Mahendra, uh, thank you for the invitation, Pak, gitu. Uh, also to uh, my warm greetings to other colleges ya yeah, uh, at Mula Warman University, uh, also from the other universities as well. Um, including the other participants ya yeah, uh, invited invite participants i heard from Mbak Najida there are also um, uh, lawyers uh, judges and so forth ya yeah. uh, um, so my name is Rico Andi Bibowo i am a lecturer at the administrative law department at University of Gajah Mada and i'm also a member of uh, CALS ya yeah, Constitutional and Administrative Law Society um, so, uh, Mbak Najida, would it, Pak Thomas, will it be okay if I speak in Bahasa? Okay. Yeah, uh, just for the for, I think it will be comfortable for the other participants. Yeah, but don't worry, Pak Thomas, I I I provide the uh, presentation on English, so hopefully it will be um, it will serve everyone. Yeah. Uh, Ya, yeah, uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian. So this is the title. Uh, sorry, maaf. The, the, the judul, judul yang saya bawakan adalah ini uh, hubungan antara hukum administrasi, perkembangan hukum administrasi di Indonesia, ya, dan uh, autokratisasi, gitu ya, autokratisasi. So uh, jadi saya bilang bahwa ini adalah preliminary overview atau uh, apa, uraian singkat. Kenapa singkat? Karena sekalipun um, saya mencoba mencermati situasi yang ada, uh, saya perlu riset lebih jauh lagi. Tetapi saya pikir uh, the finding that will be shown in here will be uh, ya yeah, will be already sufficient for us to take some conclusion. Yeah. Although perhaps not as rigid as if it's if if it's a, a, a product of a longitudinal research. Yeah. Uh. Ini agak susah ini ternyata kalau misalkan presentasinya bahasa Inggris, selidah saya bawa-bawanya pakai bahasa Inggris juga. Tapi saya akan coba ini ya. Um, saya coba pakai ini. 
Jadi Bapak Ibu sekalian, gitu ya. Diskusi ini akan sangat diskusi ini sangat penting karena kita sedang mendiskusikan tren pendulum yang terjadi di dunia saat ini, gitu ya. Kenapa seperti itu? Karena seluruh dunia sedang mendiskusikan bahwa authoritarianism has been rising. Ya. Authoritarianism sedang menguat, gitu. Itu mau menguatnya di nggak cuma di negara-negara dunia ketiga, tapi juga bahkan negara-negara Eropa ataupun misalkan Amerika Serikat misalkan dengan presiden yang sebelumnya di Prancis misalnya sekarang ini tadi Pak Heng sudah bilang bahwa hari Senin akan ada election ada pemilu gitu ya kandidatnya yang menang unggul itu yang namanya Lapen bukan Lapen yang di Jogja itu yang untuk minum arak gitu ya tapi Lapen namanya memang namanya las pasti pen gitu ya Um, yang sangat apa sangat narrow minded sangat apa um, sa- komitmennya untuk menjaga demokrasi itu dipertanyakan. Nah karena ada beberapa definisi ya, ya saya pikir menjadi penting untuk membicarakan bahwa when we are, ketika kita berbicara tentang authoritarianism maka itu bisa disinonimkan uh, dengan autokrat autokratisasi gitu ya, autokratisasi gitu ya. Apa maksudnya autokratisasi? Maksudnya adalah any move away atau semua pergerakan yang menjauhi dari proses demokrasi. Jadi ini misalkan di dalam gambar ini ya, di dalam ini ada semua hal dari demokrasi itu autokrasi, itu adalah autokratisasi gitu ya. Kalau cuman demokrasinya nurun itu dianggap democratic recession. Tapi kalau udah meloncat ke sana dianggap sebagai democratic breakdown gitu ya. Tapi kalau misalkan full autokratisasi tapi semakin mengental itu disebut sebagai autocratic consolidation gitu ya. Kenapa ini relevan Bapak Ibu sahabat sekalian karena kita di dalam di dunia ini sedang menghadapi gelombang ketiga dari autokratisasi gitu ya. Kalau yang pertama sama kedua itu relatif gampang, kenapa? Karena kelihatan jelas pasti caranya misalnya dengan uh, military coup misalkan atau dengan invasi militer atau dengan uh, dissolving atau apa membubarkan parlemen atau membubarkan uh, apa uh, peradilan misalkan caranya cara-cara klasikal tapi kalau sekarang konteksnya sekarang ini adalah kontemporer autokratisasi ya, jadi kontem- autokratisasi kontemporer apa itu maksudnya yaitu dia lebih halus mainnya, dia pinter, dia belajar di pengalaman sebelumnya. Jadi dia itu pemimpin yang memimpin apa? Memimpin secara absah, gitu ya. Tapi kemudian mau memperpanjang masa jabatannya. Dia mau memperpanjang masa jabatannya. Dia mau pelan-pelan merapuhkan sendi-sendi demokrasi, gitu. Dengan cara hukum dengan cara yang legal. Jadi kelihatannya seakan-akan itu tetap legal. Dan itu mencapai 68% dari kontemporari atau uh, autokratisasi kekinian yang terjadi. Nah, um, autoritarianisme atau autokratisasi ini adalah secara sederhana itu adalah cara untuk mensabotase akuntabilitas. Gitu ya. Uh, jadi kalau bahasanya Glasius itu adalah apa uh, cara untuk mereduksi sosial uh, akuntabilitas sosial gitu ya. Tapi problemnya adalah Glasius ini perspektifnya sangat narrow, sangat sempit gitu ya. Kenapa? Karena uh, sekalipun dia menggunakan pendekatan atau konseptual framework yang ditawarkan oleh Mark Bovens ya, Bovens 2006 ini. Uh, tetapi dia itu hanya fokus pada satu hal yaitu social accountability. Padahal ada aneka accountability yang lain, misalkan adalah uh, professional accountability, uh, legal accountability, atau judiciary accountability dan lainnya gitu ya. Uh, padahal pada faktanya in a broad sense autokratik juga pakai strategi-strategi yang lain. Apa strateginya? Ya, Cali misalnya ya, dia bicara bicara tentang tiga strategi, three most common uh, uh, autocratic strategies. The first one is uh, yang pertama adalah autocratic legalism yang artinya menggunakan konstitusi ataupun menggunakan peraturan untuk apa? menekan atau mengekang pluralisme pandangan, uh, mengekang 
institusi yang demokratis bahkan mengekang apa peradilan gitu ya ada juga abusive judicial review jadi judicial jadi uh, apa uh, peradilan itu justru digunakan untuk uh, memfasilitasi erosi demokrasi gitu ya uh, tapi juga ada yang disebut sebagai administratif and judicial harassment nah, ini yang kemudian menjadi problematik gitu ya karena uh, administrasi peradilan itu digunakan sebagai cara untuk uh, mendisiplinkan suara-suara yang tidak sepaham dengan pemerintah. Nah, ini ya konteksnya ya, saya tidak akan jelaskan, tapi intinya adalah ada poin di sini tentang misinform ya kan, caranya accountability sabotage itu ya, in narrow sense ya, adalah hal-hal ini itu ya, misinform, disable question, disable question judgment. Nah, dengan konseptual framework yang ada ini, saya mau lihat kemudian bagaimana dengan situasi di Indonesia. Nah, ini adalah ada indication of misinform. Ini masih relatif hangat kan? Kita masih ingat gitu ya. When LBP ketika Luhut bin Sarpanjaitan this person ya. When LBP claim uh, mengklaim bahwa ada 110 juta orang Indonesia yang menginginkan pemerintah untuk fokus pada ekonomi uh, terus mengklaim bahwa 110 juta orang tersebut tidak tertarik atau berharap bahwa pemerintah tidak tidak usah membelanjakan atau memfasilitasi untuk pemilihan umum karena buang-buang uang. Nah, klaim tersebut adalah bentuk dari clear itu. Itu adalah clear bentuk dari indication of means info. Ya kan? Nah, di repetitive readina itu open the data, ya dia nggak mau open the data, gitu kan? Nah, tetapi Uh, tapi dia berarti problemnya ada nomor dua ini, ya, misinform ini. Yang lainnya gimana? Yang nomor satu saya nggak bisa komentar, tapi nomor disable question and disable passing of judgment itu masih bisa, masih oke okay, kita kita masih bisa bilang. Jadi misalkan um, kita masih bisa baca bahwa Rocky Gerung bilang bahwa uh, apa uh, Luhut itu melakukan big lies misalnya, nah, itu masih 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 terjadi gitu ya. Tetapi sekarang itu kejadiannya nanti makin ke belakang otokratik itu makin menguat bisa jadi gitu ya itu bisa jadi makin menguat kenapa karena sebagaimana dikatakan oleh si ing tadi si lurman sama limbek ya kan otokratik itu kerjanya more gradual pelan pelan sekarang demokratik aktor remain strong gitu ya nah then we have to remain strong as always gitu ya. Nah, please bear in mind, uh, uh, tolong diingat ini kan, uh, passing of judgment might have been hampered since years ago, and may remain so. Kenapa kayak gitu? Uh, kenapa kita mengkritik semakin, hak kita untuk mengkritik itu semakin dikekang? Ya karena orang semakin takut untuk mengkritik kan? 2020, risetnya IP begitu, Burhan Dinu tadi. 2021, surveinya LP3S. Sekarang 2022, the government time to create Uh, regulations which can control our uh, our opinion in social media, which it will be very dangerous in my opinion. Yeah. Nah, now I come to the pattern of the administrative law development in the last couple of years in Indonesia. Yeah, kan? It has been discussed. Uh, dijelaskan sebelumnya bahwa administrative law is not a matter of uh, sorry bahwa Hukum administrasi itu bukan hanya tentang pemberian kewenangan kepada penguasa, tapi juga pemberian kewenangan atau pemberian memberikan perlindungan untuk masyarakat. Nah, permasalahannya adalah perkembangan yang ada di Indonesia ini tidak menunjukkan menunjukkan bahwa yang berkembang itu adalah yang poin pertama, bukan yang poin kedua. Ya, um, apa buktinya? Ini bukti. First indication, planning is not fully functioning. Principle of carefulness might have been hampered. Jadi um, apa? Perencanaan kita nggak benar-benar bekerja gitu. Padahal perencanaan kita itu adalah hukum perencanaan itu adalah satu dari lima government actions. Ya, perbuatan pemerintah kalau dalam bahasa Han ya. Gitu. 
Yang yang lain kan adalah membuat peraturan, secondary regulations, membuat KTUN, membuat uh, apa uh, aturan kebijaksanaan dan membuat kontrak. Nah, ini hukum perencanaan ini sudah dikangkangi berkali-kali gitu. Bagaimana kita tahu gitu ya? Padahal hukum perencanaan ini adalah manifestasi dari asas kehati-hatian, principle of carefulness. Apa buktinya? Nanti di slide yang selanjutnya kita bisa lihat bagaimana pembangunan airport misalnya. Itu bisa dipertanyakan perencanaannya. Dari aspek apa pengambil keputusan kebijakannya maupun dari aspek keperluannya, benarkah kita perlu airport sebanyak itu? Atau misalkan tentang sekali lagi tentang IKN, hal yang sangat apa, hal yang sangat krusial terjadi akhir-akhir ini. Kita ambil contoh yang pertama saja, karena saya yakin teman-teman yang terkait dengan IKN, teman-teman di Unmul sudah lebih mafum mungkin ya di lapangan bagaimana kejadian dan dinamikanya gitu. Tapi saya izinkan saya untuk fokus ke isu yang building virus airport itu. Ini buktinya kawan-kawan sekalian. Lihat. 2018 Jokowi itu mendorong aneka bandar udara untuk menjadi bandara internasional. Spontan, secara spontan dia. Ya. 2018 dia bilang kayak gitu, 2019 dia bilang kayak gitu. Setiap kali dia datang ke aneka tempat itu dia dorong untuk bandara tersebut berubah menjadi bandara internasional. Begitu 2020, dia bilang kembali, apa memang perlu kita punya bandar sebanyak ini? Jadi spontan decision-nya. Principle of carefulness might have been infringed. That's the, ya kan? Sekarang kita lihat misalkan peta Jawa Tengah dan Jawa Timur misalnya, kawan-kawan sekalian, ini sudah sesak dengan airport semuanya. Dan airport tersebut sebagian airport yang misalkan kita masih ingat bagaimana uh, JB Sudirman Airport in here ya, ya itu baru dibangun langsung sepi peminat nggak ada band, nggak ada lagi airport nggak ada lagi maskapai yang mau terbang di situ jadi prinsip of carefulness sudah dikangkang indikasi yang kedua aspek hukum prosedur administrasi sudah diperpendek seaneka rupa oleh apa oleh secondary regulations mau pakai pp atau perpres atau apa banyak kan perpres gitu ya nah padahal Aspek hukum administrasi prosedural ini adalah memberikan kesempatan buat masyarakat untuk memberikan perspektifnya dia bahwa dia keberatan. Ini alasan saya keberatan dan segala macamnya. Nah, ini sudah dikerdilkan. Contohnya, misalkan saya sama Mbak Najida tempo hari juga terlibat ini kan eksaminasi publik putusannya kasus wadas misalnya. Itu kayak gitu. Jadi hakimnya fokus untuk isu ya ini hakimnya langsung sependapat bahwa kalau sudah perpresnya bilang kayak gitu maka sudah aman lah ya kan padahal ada ada undang-undang yang lain yang harus undang-undang pengadaan tanah yang harusnya dipertimbangkan di situ bukti yang ketiga gitu ya bahwa administration bahwa badan publik atau pejabat publik gitu ya kadang-kadang menggunakan kewenangannya untuk hal-hal yang menguntungkan dirinya dan menjatuhkan martabat orang-orang yang berseberangan dengan dia. Misalnya ini kasus terjadi ter, terjadi real gitu ya, di mana kawan-kawan NGO bahwa kasus wadas itu masuk dalam soal ujian ini, soal ujian ppkn, ya kan? Apa yang dibilang di situ? Dikatakan di situ bahwa uh, teman-teman LSM bersikap untuk melakukan provok, tindakan provokasi kepada masyarakat sehingga terjadinya mm -hmm. soal itu bapak sehingga terjadi gimana mbak mana jeda ya sehingga kawan-kawan LSM itu dianggap sebagai provokator dalam surat dalam surat, surat ujian ini gitu ya nah Nah, terus padahal kalau kita lihat perspektif demokrasi pada hal yang lebih luas gitu ya. Wah, kawan-kawan NGO itu sedang memberikan informasi yang lebih balance. Jangan sampai nanti terjadinya adalah narasi tunggal. Hanya narasi tunggal saja yang dicekoki oleh dari pemerintah gitu ya. Nanti masyarakatnya iya 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 terus kemudian nanti kaget ternyata loh kok kayak gini hasilnya gitu. Nah, kan bahaya itu. Jadi ini adalah pentingnya lebih information gitu ya. Nah, dan itu adalah esensi dari demokrasi. 
Nah, yang terakhir itu adalah um, peradilan, khususnya hukum uh, peradilan administrasi, tampak terlalu mudah untuk puas dengan keputusan KTUN atau tindakan pemerintah. Jadi, um, Badan peradilan sudah cukup puas apabila badan publik itu menunjukkan kalau KTUN atau tindakannya itu dilaksanakan berdasarkan perpres. Misalkan. Padahal perpres ter- keputusan tersebut yang berdasarkan perpres tadi, kalau kita lihat dari perspektif asas, atau kita lihat dari perspektif regulasi yang lain, ternyata dipertanyakan. Gitu. Lagi-lagi saya mengutip um, apa, kasus wadas, gitu ya, di mana hakim lebih mengokekan atau membolehkan tindakan badan publik berdasarkan perpres padahal undang-undangnya bilang tidak seperti itu. Atau kasus di PLTU Jambi misalnya, di mana pembangunan PLTU Jambi hakim fokus saja sama peraturan dirjen, peraturan apa regulasi tentang OSS dan segala macamnya PP gitu ya. Padahal um, nggak dilihat asas transparansi dan partisipasinya bagaimana padahal sudah dilanggar menurut saya asas partisipasi dan transparansi yang ada nah hal seperti itulah gitu nah dan catatan terakhir gitu ya kadang peradilan juga gitu ya menggunakan batasan-batasan yang terlampau kaku dalam mendefinisikan pasal 53 undang-undang PTUN yaitu ketika apa yang dimaksud dengan orang yang merasa terdampak akibat KTUN. Karena kenapa saya mengatakan seperti ini? Karena sebagian kasus itu mengatakan begini, hakimnya bilang gini, kalau keputusan itu tidak belum memberikan apa dampak yang negatif, maka ini berarti gugatannya prematur. Jumlahnya seperti itu. Padahal ini problematik karena bagi masyarakat harusnya peradilan sudah bisa dong memforecasting, melakukan apa, melihat bahwa ini nanti akan jadi masalah. Kalau misalkan saya tarik isu ini dalam konteks government contract, gitu ya, riset saya, gitu ya. Kalau misalkan ada orang sudah merasa dirugikan dari awal, gitu ya, dan dia bisa memprediksikan kerugian tersebut, dia bisa tunjukkan kepada peradilan. maka peradilan akan mengambil tindakan untuk mengambil putusan yang bermanfaat buat dia. Bahkan peradilan bikin statement begini, kalau Anda tidak menggugat sedari awal, maka kami belum tentu akan memberikan putusan yang bermanfaat buat Anda. Jadi sejak awal memang disuruh ribut. Jadi paradigmanya beda nih gitu. Paradigmanya berbeda bagaimana memaknai pasal 53 ini. Jadi singkatnya sekali lagi peradilan bagi saya kadang-kadang terlalu peradilan administrasi konteksnya ini terlalu cepat untuk puas dengan keputusan atau tindakan badan publik yang berdasarkan hanya berdasarkan secondary regulation, perpres, PP dan segala macamnya, permen tanpa benar-benar mengecek apakah keputusan tersebut atau tindakan tersebut sudah kompatibel dengan apa undang-undang atau konstitusi. Nah, ini adalah apa yang terakhir Bapak Ibu sekalian, sahabat-sahabat sekalian, izin gitu ya. Jadi kalau misalkan apa kesimpulan akhirnya dari semua ini nah, um, hemat saya perkembangan hukum administrasi di Indonesia tampak mengabaikan asas kehati-hatian, satu, memfasilitasi untuk badan publik lebih abai, lebih tidak hati-hati, lebih buru-buru gitu ya, lebih serampangan. Nah, dan lebih fokus untuk memberikan kewenangan yang lebih kepada badan eksekutif. Lewat apa? Lewat secondary regulation, lewat PP, Perpres, Permen dan segala macam. Benar bahwa tahun 2014 kita punya undang-undang administrasi pemerintahan gitu ya. yang memberikan ruang yang lebih besar untuk men-challenge atau menggugat tindakan badan atau pejabat tun gitu ya. Tetapi jangan lupa bahwa itu bukan warisannya presiden yang sekarang, itu adalah apa kerjaan dari presiden yang masa lalu, yang sebelumnya. 
Nah, sementara perkembangannya kayak gitu di bagian pertama, perkembangan yang kedua kita bisa lihat bagaimana uh, haknya citizen itu menjadi lebih limitatif gitu ya. Karena diburu-buru dengan atas nama pembangunan atau atas nama bisnis proses gitu ya. Dan padahal uh, sialnya atau kurang beruntungnya masyarakat Indonesia adalah uh, hukum sebagian atau itu beberapa putusan yang saya kaji peradilan administrasi tampaknya sudah cukup puas dengan argumentasi yang agak dangkal, yang hanya berdasarkan pada secondary regulations tanpa mempertimbangkan primary regulations atau bahkan pendekatan asas. Singkatnya, kalau misalkan seperti itu, maka dapat disimpulkan at least preliminary finding ini adalah um, situasi ini lebih akomodatif, memberikan ruang yang lebih akomodatif untuk terjadinya autokratisasi. Jadi perkembangan hukum administrasi Indonesia dalam beberapa tahun terakhir tampaknya lebih akomodatif untuk melayani terjadinya autokratisasi. Itu kesimpulan dari preliminary finding yang saya coba tawarkan. Demikian Mbak Najidah, waktu dan tempat kami kembalikan. Matur nuwun. Ya. Terima kasih Pak Riko. Uh, dan memang sepertinya uh, tema ini tepat ya kita bahas bahwa saat ini kondisi Indonesia ini kalau pakai bahasa mahasiswa kondisi administrasi negara ini galau sangat galau atas uh, adanya otoritarianisme kata Pak Riko tadi saudara-saudara uh, bahwa ada beberapa indikasi otoritarianisme itu ada Salah satunya adalah pelit informasi, informasi yang nggak dibuka. Pernyataannya inkonsisten. Hari ini bilang begini, bulan depan bilang begitu. Nah, ini inkonsistensi dan peradilan yang terlalu formil dalam memandang uh, hukum, terutama di PT UN, memandang KT UN itu lewat formil. Dan adanya uh, sistem yang formal untuk memaksa kepentingan uh, melalui perizinan yang akomodatifnya itu timpang semacam itu. Dan terakhir Pak Riko tadi mengatakan ada kewenangan yang lebih eksekutif dalam menentukan kebijakan melalui perspektif-perspektif perpes dan lain sebagainya. Tapi memang kadang-kadang sudah undang-undangnya ada, perdanya ada, tapi dia lebih nurut sama peraturan menteri misalnya semacam itu. Nah, ini ini yang terjadi hari ini dan itulah kegalauan uh, kegalauan Indonesia hari ini terkait dengan Uh, otoritarianisme. Terima kasih Pak Riko sudah memberikan konsep gamblang dan uh, ada 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 terakhir tadi ada kayak arah ke depan bagaimana PTUN uh, administrasi negara ke depan. Terima kasih Pak Riko dan uh, selanjutnya uh, Prof Thomas, this is your time to give us uh, information, to give us spirit and knowledge about authoritarians, and you can maybe share uh, the other perspective in other country, maybe. Uh, please welcome uh, Prof Thomas. Silahkan Prof Thomas. Thank you very much, Ivo Najita. Thank you very much for the invitation to this very interesting webinar. I need to say this is a very topic subject and not only in Indonesia, almost everywhere in the world, we have the problem of a slow development of authoritarianism. In Europe, it's a big problem. I will now talk about defensive democracy in Germany precautions and instruments in constitutional and administrative law to prevent authoritarianism. I need to ask, can you see my, my presentation here? Yeah? Okay. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, you are invited to download my materials. They are posted on my website. There is a very comprehensive material, three pages with detailed information. And you are all welcome to ask questions. Even after the event, you can contact me by email or WhatsApp. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy, human rights, and rule of law are three fundamental concepts of modern constitutionalism under permanent threat. 
Democracies are not stable. In history, most have turned once or several times into authoritarianism. The enemies of democracy never stop fighting it. Corrupt former elites thriving to regain their unjustified privileges. Political and ex religious extremists of all kinds trying to impose their totalitarian ideology and to eliminate freedom. Ultra conservatives defending so-called traditional values, which are in reality anti-democratic and anti-human rights values. You have the same almost everywhere in the world. The classical ways to abolish democracy was the military coup d'etat or the revolution. Nowadays, we have the more modern way to win elections with populist policies and to undermine democracy from within. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see an example I have here, I will show you a slide from a course, how to become a dictator, a practical instruction. If you want to become a dictator, you can learn here what you need to do, and you need to do it in the right order, it will work. I give the examples where it works. It's a course material. But I'm very sorry, it's all correct, and it all has happened and is happening in Europe at the moment. So you have indeed chosen a topic which is very, very pressing now. In Germany, we follow the concept of the defensive democracy, Wehrhafte Demokratie. You can also say militant democracy, Streitbare Demokratie. It has been first developed in 1937 by the originally German scholar, Karl Löwenstein, who had immigrated to the USA in reaction to the downfall of the Democratic Weimar Republic. Democracy must protect itself against those who want to destroy it. Democratic systems not taking precautions will perish. That is the idea of defensive democracy. Nowadays, this concept is implemented in numerous democratic countries. In my paper, I've put some links to publications which give examples. For example, in Asia, we have that in Taiwan and in uh, South Korea. It is a concept, ladies and gentlemen, to protect a functioning democracy against abuse. It is not a concept which can compensate for the flaws of a dysfunctional political system under a poorly conceived constitution. If you have that, the tricks which I will present you now will not work. But it can save a functioning democracy. Now let's come to the role of constitutional and administrative law in the defense of democracy. You will, may not like that so much what I present from the German perspective. Most precautions and instruments involve sensitive restrictions of political rights. Therefore, to defend democracy necessitates an explicit or at least clear constitutional basis. While the precautions and instruments to defend democracy are provided for in the constitution, they need to be regulated in detail in ordinary laws passed by the parliament. These laws can form part of the state organizational law or of administrative law. That depends on the national classification. That can even be uh, different that in one country, this law would be part of admin law and in another country of constitutional uh, or state organization law. The respective constitutional law and ordinary law must be seen as a unity the ordinary law must be interpreted and applied strictly in line with the constitution. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, this may make smaller the room for genuine 
administrative law concepts to defend democracy. Now I need to talk about the topic which is important for the understanding. It's not the tricks which I will represent you later, which are the main pillar to defend democracy. The main pillar is uh, the judiciary. We have a constitution learning from the failures of its predecessor. The basic law for the Republic of Germany of 1949 is a very innovative constitution, which avoids in many aspects the flaws of the Weimar constitution of Germany of 1919, which worked so badly that it finally led to the national socialist rule of Adolf Hitler. The new constitution, well, 70 years old now, organizes a stable, capable, and defensive democracy. But the system is primarily built on the effective control of public power by the independent judiciary. This is the center of all. Most important for the defense of the democracy is the judicial defense against authoritarian measures. We have powerful courts, including administrative courts, with judges who enjoy judicial independence. And we have a fundamental right of every citizen to effective legal protection against public authority. This shall prevent any authoritarian individual measures that would violate political freedoms or fundamental rights of the citizens. Fundamental rights are directly binding law in Germany, which mandates every court of justice within its jurisdiction to defend them. We don't have a specialized court or a specialized ombudsman. Every court has the mission to fight for the defense of fundamental rights, in particular against authoritarian measures. We have a powerful federal constitutional court with a comprehensive jurisdiction, especially abstract and also concrete constitutional review of laws. Every court can submit any law in a special case to the federal constitutional court of laws of, uh, and ask to check if this law is constitutional or not. We also have individual constitutional complaints of the citizen who can directly uh, appeal to the federal constitutional court. This shall prevent authoritarian laws that violate democratic principles, the rule of law and fundamental rights. And so far it has happened a lot. The constitutional court has often declared unconstitutional new laws, for example, uh, restricting the right to assembly because of uh, the fundamental rights. The risk of judges colluding with an authoritarian government is low in Germany, since the court decisions of the last instance, if they violate fundamental rights of the citizen under the constitution, they would be challenged before the federal constitutional court with a constitutional complaint which every citizen can take. However, judicial function, uh, ju sorry, judicial control has a double function, not only to protect against authoritarian measures of populist governments, but also against abusive or excessive measures of defensive democracy. So the abuse of the instrument to defend democracy would constitute a threat to democracy itself. This all has one important free legal condition. We need to know that. That is the professionality and the integrity of the judges and the trust of the citizens in the courts. The judges in Germany are highly qualified, are not corrupt, they show high professional ethics and enjoy a high reputation in the society. The judges are not only legally, but also intellectually independent. They have no regard for the will of the state 
or the religious authorities of social pressure groups or the population. What the government or the president of the state says simply does not bother them. And they are strong enough to fight down the government. But they have this mentality and they are not influenced by moods in the population, for example, the media. If there are 700,000 haters on the street and say, you must lock the, up this politician, the judge will just say, you. I am obliged to defend the law, not the will of the people. That's important. In particular, we have strict political neutrality of constitutional judges. I have been asked in a project of the um, Universitas Islam Jakarta how also gave a lecture how we choose our constitutional judges so that we get their neutrality. The system, how the judges are chosen, elected in Germany is not better than in other countries. But we have a strong tradition that the constitutional judges, once they have been elected, they forget all loyalty with the bodies who have elected them. That means even a judge which has been the minister of the interior one year ago, he does not care to bash the government or the parliament if they pass a law which violates fundamental rights. Maybe because the position of being a constitutional judge is more or less the highest what you can do in Germany. It's higher the reputation than that of the president of the state or the chancellor. Maybe this is the reason. So you need this. Our system works very much on this professional and integrity of the judges. This was not the case in the Weimar Republic. It was to be betrayed by the judges at that time. Now I will come to the individual precautions and instruments to defend democracy. We have a lot of that. First of all, of course, the dem democratic core of the constitution cannot be changed by constitutional amendment. So you cannot abolish democracy by an amendment of the constitution. I do not mention that in my paper because this is clear, you never can amend the core principles of a constitution by constitutional amendment. You would need to make a new constitution and that would be a revolution. The first topic what I propose here, ah, first of all, there are some of these instruments which include decisions of the federal constitutional court. These decisions must be taken with two thirds majority of the judges. So you see high protection against abuse. The first instrument is the prohibition of political parties which seek to undermine or abolish the free and democratic basic order. I have always written down the norm in the German basic law and in my paper too, I've put a link so you can read them uh, in English if they are available in English. What is important? Like in Indonesia, who has more or less followed the German model or, or has been inspired by the German model, political parties can only be prohibited by the federal constitutional court, not by the government. So far, there have only been two successful cases. Our constitutional court presupposes that the party is not only directed against the constitution, but is acting in an actively militant, aggressive manner. So if you have an old, a party of old men who are dreaming about the past where everything was better, but who are not able to do anything bad anymore, this party will not be prohibited. Uh, nowadays, the Constitutional Court also requires the possibility that the party's actions against the free and democratic order could be successful, at least theoretical. For that reason, the part, constitutional court has refused to declare, uh, to, to prohibit a far right wing extremist party in 2017, although it declared this party unconstitutional. 
it stated that the party was fighting against the constitution, even actively and in a militant aggressive manner, but it was so weak and so unimportant that it could not impose a threat. Most scholars like me do not follow this position of the federal constitutional court. We criticize that this new decision of 2017 makes the instrument of prohibition of political parties almost inoperable. So we think that this last one was not a good idea of the constitutional court. Well, the politicians after that changed the, amended the constitution, and now we have another instrument, the exclusion of such parties which try to undermine the free and democratic basic order. This is always the, the, the serious word, the free and democratic basic order. That means democracy, rule of law, freedom. If the party is not prohibited, it can at least be excluded from party funding, from public party funding. A part of the money which goes to the political parties in Germany comes from the state, depending on, their, on the number of votes in the elections. So the state is subsidizing in Germany all political parties, but not those who are acting actively against the constitution. However, also this can only be decided, it must be declared in a statement by the federal constitutional court. There is the first case already pending now. It, an application was filed against the right-wing extremist party, which the constitutional court refused to prohibit in 2017. So this party will at least be excluded from public party funding. The next instrument is the prohibition of associations whose aims or activities are directed against the constitutional order. This is done under the Associations Act. Well, also this presupposes that these associations pursue their aim in an actively militant, aggressive way. This is what the jurisprudence practically requires for all measures of defensive democracy. In order to prevent any abuse of these measures to fight competitors, all these measures require that the association, the organization, the citizen affected was fighting actively in a militant, aggressive way. In Germany, the Federal Ministry of the Interior will prohibit nationwide associations and the community or the land authorities will prohibit uh, local and regional associations. Usually, this is combined with the seizure and the confiscation of the association's assets the houses, the bank accounts, and so on. And the prohibition also extends to substitute organizations. Sometimes it's difficult to determine if a new organization is a substitute organization or not. For example, when it comes to fascist groups, Islamophobic groups, there are many of them, they are different. Are they substitutes of a previous one which has been prohibited or not? The same with Islamist groups, which are fighting against the constitution. In Germany, between 1964, this is a statistics I have found, and 2021, on the national level, there were 20 right-wing associations which have been prohibited, one left-wing association, and 15 Islamist groups. It's not so much. On the local level or the regional level, there have been more. Nowadays, we can say that this instrument, which is a almost purely administrative law instrument, there's only one clause which says uh, the freedom of association uh, prohibits, is not guaranteed to organizations which are directed against the constitutional order. All the rest is under administrative law. 
but it's not so effective since the extremists tend to organize uh, in decentralized networks. So they are not doing in Germany anymore one big group like the FPI in, uh, in Indonesia with, I don't know, millions of supporters. They have well-structured networks of independent small associations and every association would need to be prohibited on its own. Another aspect is that these groups easily regroup. The same for the political parties. Once one association or one party has been prohibited, the people regroup in new associations or new parties with another name, but the same persons very often, but together with other persons, they pretend that they are not um, uh, surrogate, but something new, and this causes a lot of problems then to prohibit them again. The next instrument, you know in theory, I think too, but it's much stronger in Germany. If you want to be a civil servant working for the state, and this includes university lecturers, ladies and gentlemen, you need to be loyal to the constitution and you show, need to show the willingness to defend it. This is the basic requirement of being a civil servant. A traditional principle of professional civil service in Germany. Active supporters of extremist ideologies which fight the free and democratic order, they are denied access to the civil service or they are excluded from it later. This often relates to teachers, university lecturers, police officers, and soldiers. <laughs> It affects traditionally, first of all, communists, fascists, but also Islamists. For example, Islamists who are preaching that the woman must always follow the order of the man and that there are no women rights and uh, that democracy must be um, abolished, but also Islamophobics. They would be concerned by that too. But recently, we have a lot of new kinds of extremists which have been identified even among civil servants. It's crazy. The so-called Reichsbürger, people who think that the German Federal Republic of Germany does not exist and that the old empire is still living on. The so-called self-administrator, self-survivor, who think that everybody can open his own state, just making a sign on his property, this is not Germany anymore. We have extremist querdenker, so-called corona skeptics, who say this is all a conspiracy of Bill Gates. We have extremist esoterians and anti-vaxxers. These last three groups together, maybe more than five or 10% of the population. Last week, an attempt has been stopped by the secret service and the police to buy weapons of corona skeptics and anti-vaxxers and to uh, kidnap the health, federal health minister. So, and many of these people are active in the civil service and need to be kicked out from the civil service. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the practice of this has changed significantly over time. It was much stricter during the Cold War. It was often a little bit biased rather kicking out the left-wing extremists than the right-wing extremists. But nowadays, right-wing extremism, for example, Islamophobia and racism is a big uh, focus on that. All in all, I would say there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who have been affected by that. For example, young communists in the 60s and 70s, the new leftists in Europe who could not become a teacher, in, not for the state. The next instrument is the declaration of forfeiture of certain fundamental rights. Again, by the federal constitutional court on application of the German Bundestag, the parliament, the federal government or a land government. Whoever abuses 
the communication rights, like freedom to express his opinion, freedom of the press, of academic teaching, but also some other rights, can be declared for fate of these rights for a certain time. The federal constitutional court declared the forfeiture. It may limit it to at least one year, and it needs to specify which rights are forfeited. That means the citizen does not have any more the right to, to use these rights. For example, no freedom of expression for him anymore. If he, he can be excluded from, from websites, from the social media, everything. The federal constitutional court may even impose specified restrictions which will allow the public authorities to intervene directly against the citizen without any further legal basis. The constitutional court may even deny the right to vote and to stand for election of such people and the capacity to hold public office during the time of the forfeiture. You see, this is a quite powerful instrument. Uh, Prof. Thomas, excuse me. Five minutes, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so far, this instrument has never been applied in practice. Never. In 70 years. But it's still an important reserve weapon for the future. Next aspect is to the forced transfer or retirement of judges who are fighting actively against the German constitution or the constitution of the land. We also have the impeach, which has also not been used in practice so far, has not been any case. Now we have the first case, which is we may start soon. We also have the impeachment against the federal president, also no case so far. Now we have one thing which is important, the defense of the constitution by specialized domestic intelligence services. These are is the Verfassungsschutz. We have a federal office for the protection of the constitution. And we have constitution protection authorities, agencies of the landers. These agencies, may use intelligence means, but they don't have police powers. They collect information, which then is used for the purposes of the other instruments of defensive democracy. In the fighting of extremists, this is very important because the information collected by these uh, agencies prepares all the other measures. Well, but I don't need to underline that there is a high risk of abuse of this. Therefore, there is a comprehensive administrative and even parliamentary oversight and also full judicial control of these agencies. However, they have been criticized to be a little bit blind at the right eye. And it turned out that the former president of the federal office was a right-wing radical himself. So this instrument, although effective, is also dangerous and very controversial. Now, two last aspects. We have the exclusion of untrue allegations of facts from the scope of the protection of the freedom of opinion. If somebody spreads lies, fake news, it's not protected at all from a priori by the freedom of expression in Germany. A right to lie only exists under the general freedom of action. This is another fundamental right, which can, however, be very easily restricted for any public uh, uh, interest or for the defense of any other rights. So in Germany, the authorities can easy, they could easily combat the spread of fake news in the social media, for example, if they wanted. And if they had the resources, the personal resources for that. Our constitution would ally to fight against fake news. But in reality, fake news are still going on. At the moment, in particular, disinformation campaigns by the Russian uh, secret service within Germany in German language. 
And finally, ladies and gentlemen, one issue under the Constitution, we have a special fundamental right to resist against any attempt to abolish freedom and democracy. So if an authoritarian government evolves and it becomes clear that democracy will be put to an end, we have the right to resist if no other remedy is available. That means in particular, if no legal remedies to the courts or the constitutional courts are available. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for most citizens, this is a rather theoretical option. If you cannot go to the court anymore or to the constitutional court, how do you have the fundamental right to resist? This includes violence. This may even include the right to kill the minister or the chancellor or the federal president. But for the normal citizen, this is symbolic. However, in my last German university, which was a, a university of public administration, I was teaching federal police officers who wanted to go higher in their career. They needed a university degrees. Some of them were in the group sometimes who are protecting the government, the ministers, the cabinet. So when I told them about this right to resist, it was something different. They would have the power, maybe the physical power, for example, to kill a minister or a, a chancellor who tries to turn democracy into a dictatorship. Only if no other legal remedy is available anymore. For example, if the constitutional court has been neutralized, the constitutional court justice arrested or something like that. So you see here, ladies and gentlemen, 10 instruments which I presented to you. You can read the details in my paper. Some of them are purely administrative law. Most of them are a mixture of constitutional law and administrative law. They need to be used, but not abused. This makes a difficult tight rope. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Thomas. Uh, Prof. Thomas, Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, ya, tadi uh, banyak sekali pengetahuan yang sudah di-share oleh para narasumber. Dan Bapak Ibu sekalian, diskusi ini adalah diskusi yang akan terus selalu kita lakukan. Dan hari ini Fakultas Hukum Universitas Mula Warman bekerja sama dengan Kols. Kols adalah dari Prof. Thomas. Kols is an independent organization based on lecturer from many university in Indonesia, and we make one community to share empowering and advocacy for our regulation, for better regulation, and of course restart like that. And teman-teman, mudah-mudahan diskusi ini bisa terus berlanjut. Uh, dengan pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang sangat menarik dari para partisipan semacam itu dan sepertinya Prof Thomas in here not only our student but so many lecturer another university join with our webinars I see Pak Ferry Amsari from Andalas University Profesor Susi selamat sore Prof Pak Ferry ada Dr. Dia Uyun dari Brawijaya, uh, banyak sekali ada Pak Wahyu Nugroho ini dari Universitas Sahid, kalau tidak salah. Uh, so many Prof. Thomas, uh, we happy to see you. And now we can open uh, a question from participant. Mungkin yang pertama kita bisa raise hand dulu, siapa? Muhammad Azrin. Silahkan. Dituduk, ditujukan kepada siapa? Uh, all the speakers, Bu Najiba. Putus-putus ya, Ajrin kayaknya. Uh, udah audible enggak? Ya, audible. Terdengar. Eh, terima kasih atas kesempatannya, Bu Najiba. Yes. Uh, saya bertanya pertama kepada Pak Rico, Pak Andi Kriwo, terkait dengan uh, beberapa pertanyaan dari Bapak yang bawakan. Sebelumnya, yang pertama terkait dengan uh, Art 53 terkait uh, 
undang-undang administratif bahwasanya bahwa menjelaskan adanya uh, prematur dispute atau prematur gugatan prematur itu tadi Pak sebelumnya. Bahwasanya saya melihat uh, ini akan berimplikasi terhadap banyak kasus ke depannya ketika kita melihat bahwasanya dari ketika ketika hakim berpendapat bahwasanya oh, this is uh, this is prematur prematur uh, swing uh, prematur suit di mana uh, bagaimana kita bisa mempersiapkan kepada pengadilan ketika Uh, semua kasus yang akan dibawakan kepada pengadilan tersebut akan dibilang prematur di uh, dalam opini saya pak dalam pandangan saya bahwasanya uh, kita harus melihat bahwasanya transparansi dan juga uh, kredibilitas sebagai suatu konstitusional court dalam hal ini kita melihat bahwasanya there is there is no prematur uh, prematur uh, there is no prematur gugatan dalam hal ini if we know if there's gonna be dispute in the future harusnya peralihan juga punya andil yang lebih besar pada itu so I will ask the questions for the Pak Riko terkait dengan uh, what kind of reformation yang harusnya kita bisa bangun di dalam peradilan terkait dengan seperti ini. Gitu. Okay. Banyak sekali uh, reformasi kita mungkin bagian dari uh, pengadilan administratif tadi. So this is the first questions. Dan yang uh, for my second question is for uh, Prof. Thomas. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, sir. So. I believe that the presentation is going to be compared of the constitution from the German and also Indonesia. That's going to be uh, collected by the, our the principle of the human rights and also the other principle democratic country. So my question is, uh, we know the loopholes of the governments and how they, they lead the democracy as they want, as their benefit of the interest. But the question is, uh, as an academic and as a student who looks this loopholes of the governments and with the independence of the court exactly, that uh, what kind of expectation and what kind of ideals ideals the constitutional court that's gonna be provide for the society because uh, this is gonna be uh, questionable uh, questionable because this is constitutional court is gonna be uh, provide for those kind of interests of the government or the interest of the society itself so yeah i think that's gonna be ac acceptable for the questions to answer what what kind of the expectation and what kind of reformation that gonna be provided for the next of the future of the constitutional court itself. We know the Indonesia that's gonna be presented by Pariko that's gonna be uh, using the uh, using the second uh, second regulation beside the first regulation. And then uh, I think we, we, we know the legal frameworks, there is the main legal frameworks, but they use those legal frameworks that gonna be beneficial for those kind of interests. So I think what kind of reformation, what what kind of the perspective that from Prof. Thomas and Prof. Rico regarding about this issue and the future, because we know the uh, this gonna be impacted the entire society, constitutional court, administrative law, that depends on on the democracy. But what kind of democracy that we need to pursue in the future? Uh, so I think that's question for me for Pak Rico dan uh, Prof. Thomas. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Mas Muhammad Ajirin. Tadi dari mana ya? Uh, dari ha. Angkatan 2020 uh, Mulawang University hmm. Ternyata mahasiswa saya sendiri Saya yang gak hafal itu Mohon maaf ya Jirin ya, Terima kasih uh, Mungkin pertanyaan kedua nggak ada yang raise hand Saya kasih kesempatan uh, Amelia Sidokombong tadi yang chat Silahkan Baik Bu Ini saya langsung ngomong apa jangan Bu Ya, langsung bicara aja, nggak apa-apa. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to for, for, the... for Professor Thomas, Amelia. Maybe I choose to uh, um, dua bu, Pak oh, Riko yes. dan Profesor Profesor Thomas. Uh, dok, ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Untuk Pak Riko yeah. dan Pak Thomas, oke, okay. silakan. Silakan, Amel. Sorry, Bu. Uh, mungkin saya pertanyaan, bacakan saja inti pertanyaan saya, Bu, untuk mengingat waktu, Bu. Sudah, ya. mungkin, sudah mungkin. Baik, mungkin uh, to uh, dua narasumber in this uh, presentation. Um, uh, out, uh, my question is, um, In the provisions of state administration law, what is the impact of authoritarianism in the implementation of the right and obligation of the community? Does authoritarianism occur because it is enforced by the interest of the authorities of high state of 
officially in their in their political interest. Uh, saya tujukan pertanyaan ini kepada dua narasumber. Saya ingin ingin mendapat dua perspektif yang berbeda kepada Pak Riko Adiwibo dan juga Prof Prof Uh, Prof. Dr. Thomas. Uh, ya, yeah, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Naji. Sama. You have two question, Prof. Thomas and Dr. Rico. Uh, Amelia, uh, this question is related with uh, a political interest, maybe. Like that. Saya persilahkan, uh, Prof. Thomas mungkin atau Pak Rico dulu. Of Thomas, maybe. Oh, okay. I I think uh, the second question you would need to repeat. I, there are some problems uh, with the signal. I do not get everything, so you would need to repeat. But on the first question, I think I got it correctly, right? What interests are the judges defending and the and the just judges of the constitutional court in in Germany? That. Is it the interest of the people? I can clearly say, no, that is not the job of the judge. The judge is, does not have the job to defend the interests of the people. The judge defends the, inter, the law. That means what is regulated in the law as long as the law is constitutional, as long as the law does not violate democracy, rule of law, and human rights itself. So the question, who defends the interests of the people? That shall be the institution, the government and on the parliament. If they don't do, the people need to vote for a different government or a different parliament. The judges in Germany, they have the very clear idea. We are, like the French says, the bouche de la loi. We are the mouth of the law. We are defending nothing but the law. But only the law if it does not violate higher law. For example, the judge would not defend any law which violates human rights. That he would not do. But uh, other political questions, the people of the interest, the people of the individual, which often must be balanced, that is the responsibility of the politicians, that means of the state institutions, government, parliament, but not of the judge. Well, uh, Ibo Najita, could you please uh, uh, repeat the question of uh, Amelinda, because I did not hear everything. Oh, yes. Uh, we, we... It is actually on the chat, Pa Thomas. Sorry? Ah, no, yeah, but it's in Bahasa. Uh, in the above of that. Ah, okay. He provides ah, I see, I see. Okay. Ah. In the provision ah, of I, state I, I, administrative well, law. Concerning this question, my question is in the provisions of statement administration law, What is the impact of authoritarianism in the implementation of the rights and ob obligations of the community? We shall, in Germany, we say quite clearly, no impact. There must not be any impact. Usually, if there is an authoritarian government, it must be stopped. It acts illegally. So in the law, there can be all the dirty tricks They cut down the rights, they cut down the procedural rights and tricks like Pakrico described, but this will then be eliminated by the constitutional court or if it's regulation already by the administrative court. So authoritarianism must not have any impact in the law. If there is an impact of authoritarianism, that means in the law, that means that the system is already severely sick. So uh, authoritarianism, does it occur because it, it's influenced by the interests of the authorities or high state officials in their political interests? Yes, that second part of your question, I would say yes, but there are different kinds. Some authoritarians just want to um, corrupt. They want to make profit and they don't want to be controlled by the public. 
and they don't want to be criticized. But the more dangerous one even, you can see that in East Europe are those who are fighting against democracy itself, maybe even without being corrupt. Some are not corrupt, but they want to destroy your freedom. They don't want to allow you to live your freedom anymore. I have lived in a very, very corrupt country, the Republic of Moldova, which is between Romania and Ukraine. And, and it was a totally a mafia run country. Everything, parliament and government was just mafia. But the freedom, the funda, your human rights situation was quite good. So they did not stop anybody. Everybody could live freely. They just wanted to steal the money from the country. And that they did. So, but the authoritarian regimes often have a different approach. They cannot accept that the citizen is free, that he has his own uh, lifestyle. For example, many authoritarian regimes in Europe or parties, they are Islamophobic. They cannot accept that they are Muslims by building mosques and doing Muslim prayers and Muslim lifestyle in Europe. They are not corrupt. Some are, some are, most are not, but they are fighting against our fundamental values as they are enshrined in the constitution. So, so uh, for that reason, I would say, um, Authoritarianism is not always only for the own interest. It can be for an ideology. Some of these authoritarians or autocrats even think that they have the mission to destroy freedom in the world. And then the law must stop them. Does this answer your question? No. Yeah. Uh, I the questions. Yeah, Ajirin. Tadi Ajirin, the question from Ajirin is about premature dispute. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. But my comments regarding the statement from the Mr. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. I was, I was get the. I was the get that. That's gonna be interesting part because uh, you stated that was uh, authorism is not only uh, about uh, about their own interests, but it's gonna be a kind of ideology. That's gonna be uh, some kind of interesting part because beside that, beside that, uh, maybe it's the it's aligned with the how the government's managed and how the court is uh, based on the uh, legal products. That's gonna be more important things for this kind of the topic of the issue. So regardless of everything about the public society uh, regarding the interests of the society, so the most important the most, uh, the most important things that we need to uh, focus on this topic is about the uh, how the legal frameworks that's going to be pushed up the constitution itself. Uh, is that correct, uh, well, Prof. Thomas? And then uh, and elaborate again more about the regarding the uh, those kind of uh, example that you provide before. Uh, that's that there are the uh, corrupt country, but uh, there's gonna be gonna be a, a ideology at the end. But uh, they also provide the some kind of excellence in human rights at the end. But I, we know that's gonna be a cost for the uh, corrupt country itself. I think that's I want to add before. Yeah. 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 Shall I answer to that? That is from Thomas. I think we have to about that. Sorry. Bentar. Ya, bentar. ya, mungkin berikutnya Pak Rico. Ya, uh, ya, makasih banyak Mbak Najida. Uh, ya. uh, sebelumnya saya ingin menyapa dulu senior-senior uh, saya, ada Prof. Susi sama Kak Ferry. Ya. <tuh> Um, saya coba menjawab pertanyaan tadi ya, yang bicara tentang tidak prematur saya, kalau benar yang saya pahami mungkin uh, concernnya uh, apa tadi, Mas yang tadi itu bicara tentang ini ya, uh, tentang kenapa tadi kan saya bicara tentang itu, bicara tentang uh, 
prematur tadi ya tentang hal yang prematur tadi gini hemat saya ke uh, mas 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 tadi yang mas penanya tadi ya. nah um, PT UN itu bersikap apa bersikap taf bersikap rumah atau memberikan standar yang tinggi gitu kan bahwa enggak nih masih prematur itu karena ada beberapa hal pertama karena logikanya karena dia itu meyakini principle of good administration has been occurred at the first place gitu kan bahwa sudah carefulness sudah dilaksanakan sama badan publik kehati-hatian sudah dilaksanakan sudah transparan sudah ini sudah itu itu adalah presumptionnya karena itu presumptionnya makanya ada apa makanya dia bikin setting standarnya yang lebih tinggi gitu ya yaitu um, ya kalau memang belum terdampak resmi nggak usah jangan dong masuk ke kami atau um, semua keputusan KTUN wajib dianggap benar uh, dan uh, bisa langsung dilaksanakan uh, apa sampai nanti kecuali nanti kalau misalkan dinyatakan sebaliknya oleh peradilan tata usaha negara nah because it starts from the uh, presumption that uh, the administration has conduct has, has adhered to the principle of good administration then they have a tendency to uh, more restricted yeah. hmm. well it is it is reasonable on the first place yeah it is reasonable on the first place but then uh, it is also the obligations of the uh, of the judges to scrutinize whether or not yeah. Yeah. the principle has been really adhered Yeah. Uh, if the judges can predict that there, the principles have been violated, then it is necessary for him or her to defend that principle. Itu poin saya, gitu kan? Makanya saya bilang di sini kan, principle approach should be more considered. The judges, hakim, ya, yeah, should not only satisfy. Only based on the uh, secondary regulation, it is not sufficient. Please do research more. Gitu. Itu pesan saya buat um, sahabat-sahabat di uh, bapak ibu di bapak ibu hakim yang mulia, gitu ya. But please jangan salah paham ya. Please do not do not uh, please don't feel uh, upset with my statement, gitu ya. Because I also not notified that administrative court in certain cases. have been performed pretty well. Apa contohnya? Misalkan adalah ketika dulu ya, when the administrative court declare that the government has conduct unlawful activity when the government cut off the internet connection in Papua. Itu keren. Keren itu dia bilang itu. Ya kan? Atau misalkan years ago during the Soeharto era, uh, Mas, Mas Herlambang Gurat Raman misalkan disertasinya ya dissertation in Leiden University he mentioned that uh, when the Suharto regime uh, stop the uh, uh, Tempo magazine ya Tempo magazine you cannot uh, continue your publication uh, and then administrative court said that no no uh, that decision is illegal. That, that's a very cool, and it was occurred during Suharto era. Jadi, uh, I would like to express that uh, the administrative court in certain point has conduct a very good job, but then in cert- the other points, I, I, including Mbak Najida, have found that some administrative judges are too relaxed, are, are too restricted, in, or are too, too easy in... in already to conclude that the government has has adhered to the um, uh, principle of legality just because of the decision or action are supported by the secondary regulation that's my that's the critic mas terus um, yang kedua tadi pertanyaannya siapa tadi mbak yang perempuan ya um, tadi bicara tentang uh, apa Authoritarianism, apakah itu does authoritarianism occur because it is influenced by the interest of the authorities, gitu ya? Ya, perhaps, uh, perhaps like what Pak Thomas have explained ya, uh, 
there are very very various reasons ya. Uh, but um, if I understand it correctly, the general tendencies are they would like to hold their power as long as possible. Uh, dengan cara apa? Uh, dengan cara tadi misalkan adalah to prevent uh, public accountability, ya kan? So they they keep maintaining that they are popular in, in the society. So If any people criticizing them, ya yeah, nanti makanya zoomnya nanti bisa dihack, ya kan? Nah, Instagramnya di take over, WhatsAppnya di brand, eh, WhatsAppnya diambil, ya kayak kayak model-model gitu deh. Nah, apa nanti websitenya di take down dan segala macamnya. Nah, jadi uh, tentu itu yang menjadi if, if that's the the usual motif, ya. Yeah, I, I I would say, like to say that it is a usual motif. It does not necessarily mean that there is no other motif, ya. Yeah. But that's the usual motif. So perhaps those two, uh, those uh, and uh, I hope those answers my uh, your your concern, Mbak Lingkungan and Mbak Mbak Ame, Amelinda dan Mbak Amelinda si Adrian. Oke, okay. thank you very okay. much. Ya, sama-sama. Terima kasih, uh, Pak Rico, Prof Thomas. But time, I have my watch time to limit. In di di Kalimantan Timur ini sudah mau mendekati berbuka <laughs> setengah jam lagi. Uh, I hope we have a next webinar and uh, this webinar uh, give us information uh, that administrative law is. In not good condition, start from regulation, court, government, perspective, and so many more legal modus. Uh, Prof. Thomas and Rico say that legal modus for tendencies, uh, regulation like that. Uh, so many dichotomy, so many problem, and so many indication that we are in, now is in authoritarianism condi uh, condition like that. Uh, Prof. Thomas, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your attention, for your spirit, for us today, uh, Rico, terima kasih sudah berkenan sharing uh, dengan kami pada sore hari ini, uh, dan terima kasih juga kepada teman-teman uh, calls, Constitutional and Administrative Law Society. Tapi uh, tadi sudah dibuka dengan oleh Pak Dekan. Uh, boleh kami juga mendengarkan uh, sedikit pesan yang disampaikan oleh koordinator uh, calls yang dalam hal ini akan disampaikan oleh Pak uh, Ferry Amsari dari Universitas Andalas. Saya persilahkan Pak Ferry. Thank you. Apa Bye. ada yang dipesankan untuk adik-adik mahasiswa dan juga teman-teman semuanya? Terima kasih. Thank you, Miss Najida. Uh, I would like uh, to use English because I assume most of us can understand it. Uh, thank you uh, to Prof. Thomas Smith and to Prof. Hank Edding who had been willing to give lectures today. And thanks also to our colleague, Dr. Rico Andy Wibowo Um, who did not only provide an overview of the problems on Indonesian state administrative law, but was also involved in preparing this event. Of course, uh, especially thank you. I would, I would like to say thank you very much to our colleague at Faculty of Law, University of Mulawarman who really eager to make this uh, event happen. Uh, as it is known that Indonesian democracy is entering a pace that is quite dangerous. The political debate in the last two election has created tremendous separation among society. Uh, this condition is sharpened by various government policies and action that ignore the value of the rule of law, such as uh, neglecting human rights uh, principles, enacting the bad uh, uh, regulation, 
one of the famous bad regulation uh, currently is omnibus law of job creation. And we also have a problem with uh, untrusted judiciary and government through the minister, uh, the minister, the minister who are ignoring the constitution. As I already mentioned uh, by two of the speakers. Uh, Prof. Smith also explained about the role of the constitutional court power on constitutional complaint in uh, protecting democracy. As far as I know, uh, Indonesian constitutional court also uh, try to learning uh, to constitution, constitutional court in Germany, uh, but I think uh, probably they failure to learn something in Germany. <laughs> uh, Indonesian constitutional court has its own problems with its political decision that show the intervention of political interests since the judges were appointed. In fact, this is a little bit gossip, yeah. Soon there will be a wedding between the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court and the President's younger sister. It is difficult for the Chief Justice, I think, yeah, uh, to avoid conflicts of interest in many cases in the Constitutional Court. Uh, you might not believe that the Chief Justice already declared very, very confident that he will not step down from his position because he believe that there will no conflict of interest if uh, there is a, you know, uh, uh, a application that uh, uh, against or dispute uh, with the government. So uh, that's the Indonesian, I think, uh, will face a lot of problem uh, through constitu constitutional court. And I do agree with uh, Dr. Rico that uh, some of uh, administrative court decision are, are really, really uh, good in some perspective, yeah. And of course, uh, Carl's uh, hopes this, this seminar, this seminar uh, had been uh, uh, had been uh, giving some impact to most of us. Uh, this seminar had been discussed uh, mostly the administrative side that is often neglected by the state uh, in order to achieve the political interest. Some of the issue uh, regarding uh, uh, election dispute, yeah, uh, I think not uh, many of that issue uh, explained by Dr. Rico because uh, somehow that issue is not probably not really interesting with, uh, uh, to him. Uh, but uh, I do believe that most of us uh, got many, many things from the presentation uh, from two intellectual from the Netherlands and Germany, uh, as well as one of our colleague were very important to illustrate how administrative disorder will will let us to an authoritarian regime uh, of the government in the future. Um, so hopefully this discussion will help the public and academician understand how important the administrative aspect in building the rule of law. So again, thank you, Prof. Smith, uh, and also Dr. Rico for this fruitful discussion. Thank you.
Bang. Ya, terima kasih uh, Pak Ferry. Mungkin saya juga berharap ada spirit speech pro, dari Prof Susi. Prof Susi bisa mungkin satu dua kata untuk mahasiswa kita, Prof. Ini sedikit perempuan di Indonesia yang bisa bicara lantang kalau ada Prof Susi. <laughs> Silakan, Prof. Thank you, Mbak Najida. Uh... Uh, it's very uh, pleasure yeah, to uh, to present with uh, in in this uh, virtually uh, uh, discussion. And uh, from the presentation, uh, we know that the administrative law will play a very fundamental role in Indonesia, in particular uh, relation to the how the government would be able uh, to carry out its uh, duties based on the rule of law. So uh, I hope that in the future, uh, there would be uh, many uh, law students that uh, can uh, take uh, administrative law as their uh, specialization. So uh, I think that uh, the discussion will not uh, stop here, but cause constitutional and administrative law uh, society will also uh, conduct another uh, discussion uh, in relation to the very hot topic uh, in constitutional and administrative law aspect. So uh, please uh, for the law students to, uh, to be prepared uh, to the challenging uh, task or uh, the challenging uh, situation that currently uh, happened in Indonesia. Uh, I hope that uh, this discussion will be uh, fruitful uh, to enhance uh, the understanding of the Indonesian law uh, students uh, with, uh, relation, uh, the, with a relation in administrative law. That's a very uh, short and, and thank you, uh, Professor Smith, uh, Professor Thomas Smith and uh, Mas uh, Rico for uh, your very interesting uh, presentation. Yes, thank you. Terima kasih, Prof. Susi. Uh, dan sekali lagi saya juga berucap thank you very much for Professor Thomas, Mas Rico, dan seluruh uh, partisipan semuanya. Dan saya juga mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Pak Dekan Fakultas Hukum Universitas Mula Warman yang selalu bisa open untuk webinar-webinar bersama calls. Dan kita semua juga berharap akan ada webinar-webinar berikutnya. Mudah-mudahan apa yang kita laksanakan dalam tiga jam ini bisa menghasilkan sebuah spirit dan juga sebuah academic movement yang lebih sehat dan lebih demokratis tentunya untuk kebaikan kita semuanya. Mudah-mudahan bermanfaat, selamat menjalankan ibadah puasa, dan sebentar lagi juga kita akan mendekati berbuka puasa. Saya Najidah, mohon maaf, I'm so sorry if I... jika saya ada kata-kata yang tidak berkenan di hati, <tuh> Mudah-mudahan sekali lagi memberikan manfaat kita semua. Terima kasih semua mahasiswa Fakultas Hukum dan juga Prof. Thomas, Mas Riko, Prof. Susi, Pak Mahendra, Daveri. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Terima kasih, Ibu. Pak Dekan, pamit. Thank you, thank you. Terima kasih. 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 Terima kasih.